This is easily the funniest book I've ever read. Welcome, my mere mortalites, to another round of the book reviews. My name is Karen, and I do these book reviews to help those who want to transcend beyond their own mere mortality. Today, we have a fun, interesting book about war, hence my setup, hence my gear. Yes, indeed, we're going into one of the best war books I have ever read. It's Catch-22 by Joseph Heller. This book was published in 1955, and it's about 450 pages in length. So it's a, a fairly thick one, but it's a good read. So you are not uh, worrying about the page length, that's for sure. It's set off of northern Italy on the fictional island of Pianoso, or at least what is described in the book is much larger than the actual little bit of island that is there. And it's set during the World War II period. So it's a U.S. Army Air Force base, I would say, and they are flying missions into the northern Italy, into Germany, fighting against the Nazis. The story revolves around Yossadian, or Captain Yossadian to be exact. So here's a bombardier in one of the planes, the guy sitting in the glass cubicle, the bubble, setting his sights on the Germans, dropping the bombs, and then they return home. And you think, okay, that's a pretty simple story. They go out, they drop their bombs, they do their work, they return back to the airbase. But Yossadian has a problem, and it's that everyone is trying to kill him. They're all out to get him. So the Germans are trying to kill him. His own friends are trying to kill him. The army in general, everything, the war is trying to kill him, and he's absolutely terrified. So the story revolves around him trying to get out of these flying these missions and hence the name Catch-22. This is where this comes from. It's really a look, the book as a total, about the absurd army politics, absurdity of war and also the mundanity of war, just how boring it can get but also how dangerous it is at the same time. There are a lot of characters in the book. So there are his fellow pilots or Nate Lee Clevenger. There's other people associated with the army. So this is some of the Colonel Cathcart, Colonel Korn, Major, 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 and Milo Munderbinder. And then there's also people in Rome and Italy, the whores that they frequently visit. There's just this whole collection, this crew of characters. Each one of them is pretty unique. And because the book is so long, it does get to flesh out their individual personalities as well. About the author and the book itself, as I already mentioned, it was World War II inspired. So Joseph Heller actually did have experiences as an Air Force captain, as flying these planes, as being on Air Force bases. This was his first book published. So damn, what the hell, what an amazing first book and it almost got tossed because his writing process of it did take such a long time. It wasn't an immediate hit in the US when it first came out but when it reached its way over to England I think they appreciated the dry dark sense of humor the British black humor uh, that is sort of contained within it and the absurdity and then since then it's just been an absolute stardom of, of World War II and of I guess war books in general. The first theme that arises is Catch-22, the funny side of paradox. So what is the originations of this? Everyone knows what Catch-22 means. It's a part of the English lingo, the language nowadays. So we start off with Yossari in the book doing everything he can do to avoid the war. So he's in the hospital feigning illnesses. He's poisoning the mess hall so that everyone doesn't have to participate, including him. He's doing everything he can to weasel his way out and he's going to his superior officers and in particular to Dr. Nika and saying, hey, doc, ground me, I don't want to fly. So grounding is obviously being deemed unworthy of flying, unfit to fly. And so the doc says, okay, well, I can ground you if you're insane. And he's like, um, okay, well, I'm in, insane. I, I don't want to fly these planes. It's terrible. Everyone's out to kill me. And the doc goes, ah, but no, you can't do that because if you don't want to fly, that shows your your sanity because you have to be crazy to fly. You have to be insane to actually go up there and do these missions. People are trying to kill you. And so he's going, okay, but no, I, I am insane though. He's like, no, but you just showed your sanity. So therefore you have to fly. And then he's saying, but if you're flying, you're therefore crazy and you should be grounded. So that's where the catch-22 comes in and he goes, oh, that's actually a nice catch. Yossarian actually admires it. So it really does capture that absurdity, the funny side of paradox when you can't take a step forward, you're trapped in this loop and there is no escape from it. Whatever action you do, you're sort of screwed either way. So why do catch-22s arise? How does it actually come to be? Is this part of the universe or is this just something that humans create? And I think it's a bit of a mix between the two. So if you really think about it, 
humans love black and white. We love this being this and this being that. But when it tends into that gray area, we really have struggles in determining, oh, should I treat it this way or should I treat it that way? And we've all seen those images where it's a, a girl, a ballerina rotating. And then if you look at it a particular way, you can watch it rotate the other way. Or, you know, is the dress white or blue? This was a big internet phenomena a couple of years ago. So we do have that aspect of it. And then I think just in nature as well, things are always a changing, things are always evolving. So it's really hard to pin something down. Now, I would guess if I had to say a catch-22 is almost like a byproduct of organizations. So when you get enough people together, you have enough competing ideas and what this should be. And then just adding into the nature, the mix, the change that always occurs. It's almost like it's a byproduct of bureaucracy. Catch 22 is when you're sort of screwed either way. You can't do anything because this will piss off this person. If you do the other thing, it'll piss off this person. And so you're stuck in a catch 22 no matter what you do, you're screwed. So catch 22s arise, what can one do about it? Well, I think this book teaches you what the appropriate action is. And it's to laugh, it's to take it not too seriously to almost develop an insanity of your own to be able to comprehend that this situation has arised and you're stuck in the middle of it. So do whatever you can, have a laugh at it and just move on, just accept it as part of the universe. Because if you really try and solve it, fix it, I mean, go ahead, go nuts. But when you've got unmoving bosses like Yossarian does in the book with the Colonel Korn, Colonel Cathcart, General Peckham, all these people who are just, you know, out of their mind in their own rights, but also uncaring, unmoving, don't give a shit, you're really going to struggle. So the best option is probably just to try and exit yourself from the situation and just not even play the game or just entirely remove yourself because if you try and solve the catch-22, you're probably just going to be grinding your gears and going in circles for infinity. The second theme that jumps out at me is the wastage of war or ridiculous futile bureaucracy in action. So I think this book overall, I would say is an anti-war book. It doesn't paint a picture of war being this glamorous, fun thing to be doing. Every character in it is <laughs> struggling with their own problems, particularly Osarian, but you can see as the book goes on, it gets a little bit deeper and darker. And I'll, I'll talk about that in a second. But the epitome of this wastage is Milo Mindabinder and his, or Mindabinder and his activities. And I think there's a grain in truth of, of everything that he's doing, even though it is exaggerated and hyperbole and, you know, absurd. So he is the mess officer and essentially he gains this position of power by bringing exotic foods in and all the colonels and all the army officers and everyone loves him because he has this conglomeration that he's formed to bring in food and to make himself rich and other people rich because everyone has a share. So he always is repeating how all the things that he's doing is for the good of everyone because everyone has a share in his activity. So what are the sort of things he's doing? Well, We'll look at his eggs, for example. This is a really funny scene where he's explaining how that he gets eggs for such a cheap price and brings them in, even though he's buying them for $7, selling them for $5, and then making a profit somehow. And you just go, how the hell is that, Milo? You know, what are you doing? And he has this convoluted scheme where he buys the eggs in Italy, he transports them over, he sells them to his own messes, and through this whole process, you eventually learn like, oh, okay, what he's sort of doing is just getting money from an external source, i.e. the government, and creating this closed loose system where he can just continually transfer the profits to himself, essentially. So this is one of the wastages of war, I guess. There's just this, you know, government, tremendous amount of money coming in and people can just do with it what they will. And it's not overseen to the highest degree. It doesn't make complete sense. One of his other activities is when he is financing both sides of the war. So he actually has one scene where he is financing his own aircraft to bomb his own air base. So he's directing the operations from the control tower saying, yeah, no, you need to strafe this area a little bit more. We want a tight pattern, you know, bomb this area, etc., etc." And everyone is like, oh, he's gone too far. He can't do that. He's killed his own man. He's wasted, you know, essentially done friendly fire intentionally. And everyone's thinking, man, he's screwed. He's going to be hung for this until he opened the books and showed how much of a profit he made by doing this. And everyone's like, whoa, Milo, who's a genius. 
He also does this where he finances the Germans, he finances the Americans, and then as they're attacking each other, each side wins because each side gets money from it. It's just absolutely crazy. So when you're really getting down to it, I think this book exposes one of the truths of war that it is just tremendously destructive and a tremendous amount of waste. You're creating bombs to kill people so that X, you know, what's what's the purpose of this? And you can have all these ideas related to that, which is, you know, we're doing it for sovereignty, we're doing it to protect the world, we're doing it, et cetera, et cetera. But a lot of the time it comes down to producing a lot of things to then destroy them. And it's just, you know, if we ever think about World War One or World War Two, how many buildings, how much material did we extract from the ground simply to blow up again and have to be removed and then reused and recycled? It's just absolutely insane. A common argument you'll hear against this is that, but war is creative and stimulating. Think of all the inventions that have come out of it. Think of all the financing into new technologies and things like this. For me, on balance, I can sort of understand that, but I'd also just say, man, it seems to be more destructive than it is creative. So even though you do get these technologies from it, it's just like, okay, if we think of all the people who died and all of them were applying themselves just in the normal world like we are doing right now, how much more creative things could have come from this? Do you need that impetus, that push, that fear of death, that negative, I guess the stick in this situation of hitting the donkey from behind? Or is the carrot more essential in, in total? For me, like I said, I'm, I'm quite anti-war in general. So when I read books like this, it, it really resonates with me. But I can sort of understand that other point of view as well. Onto my personal observations and takeaways. The book is the perfect length. So as I was reading it through, I was getting more towards the end of the book and I was thinking, oh, you know, it's probably starting to drag on a bit too much now. I really don't want to read an extra 100, 150 pages, which is what I had on here. And then boom, the book ended. So those last 150 pages were actually observations, people commenting on the book. So for me, it got right to that point of potentially being too much and then just stopped. So the finale was perfect for me. In terms of how it was set out as well, it's very funny for the first 350, 375 pages, I would say. Just very humorous. There are some hints at darker parts of the book, but as it gets more towards the end, and this is what I was referring to earlier, it can it does become deeper, darker, more sad. So this is where we learn about Snowden and his, I guess, incident with Yossarian, where Snowden's in the plane, a piece of shrapnel comes through, slices open his leg, and it's horrif- horrifying, And but it's all going to be okay. And then Yossarian helps him, opens up his jacket and his just insides fall out. He's been absolutely ripped open by a piece of shrapnel, by a piece of flak. We also hear of the Mick Watt and Kid Samson story. So this is where Mick Watt flies his plane too low. Kid Samson jumps up and is just the propellers turn him into red dust, red mist. And his legs are just standing there on the beach. Also Dunbar, his death, who was a classic character in the book and is you know essential to it it's just this continual deep dark descent into the horrifying parts of war and this is where yosarian is not having fun and being crazy and it's it's almost like the darker side of insanity the darker side of of crazy as i mentioned in some of my recent book reviews the writing has this fantastic technique of foreshadowing so we see in each of the chapters that comes, there is something that's being hinted at. So there's about 42, 43 chapters in total, and each one of them has a reference previous in the book. And you do have to have in your mind a recollection of what was hinted at earlier. So we hear about Yossarian standing in the tree naked and being awarded a medal for um, going around twice and whatnot well before we actually get the full story of what actually happened. So it's really fun where you just get this new story and you're like connecting it to something that happened earlier and go, oh yeah, okay, I totally understand what that was about, why that was necessary. It has so many memorable scenes as well, which really just stick in your mind. They'll be hard to get out of. So for me personally, the moaning during the briefing is just one of the funniest things I've ever heard. Any of the hospital scenes where they're 
faking illnesses and doing all these crazy things and there's the soldier in white and the texas who's annoying and drives everyone out of the hospital and milo minderbinder or minderbinder and his activities the scene where he flies across the world buying and trading and uh dragging ore and i believe uh yosarian with him along this whole adventure was just absolutely crazy i, I loved it to a t so so many memorable scenes in this book and then also catch 22 there's a reason why everyone knows this because it it got to the heart of something it got to the heart of absurdity of paradox of of war as well and the destruction that is occurring within it but also the funnier side of it and how you almost need to approach these situations so in summary funny is an understatement it is hilarious so many times during the evening I was reading and had to stifle my laughter or make sure I wasn't laughing too loudly and disturbing the neighbors. It just one of those books where every couple of pages you will find something to laugh at. It does contain disturbing, gory scenes. It is, after all, about war. So don't be surprised if that jumps out at you. And in total, it just encompasses the frustrating nature of bureaucracies, particularly of the army, as this is what the book is about or the Air Force. But also, it, it really just gets to the heart of paradox, of, of humor, and it's just a wonderful, wonderful book. I'm giving it one of my highest ratings ever. As I mentioned, this was a reread for me, so I knew what it was about, and I still absolutely loved it. Catch-22 by Joseph Heller, 9 out of 10, just absolutely fantastic. And so that's it for today, my mere mortal lights. What do you think of Joseph Heller's Catch-22? Have you read it? Do you find it as funny as I did? I would love to know in the comments. And who is your favorite character as well? Because so many individuals really stand out for me in this book. And I would love to know who stands out for other people. Other than that, if you can do all the nice things, like, subscribe, hit the bell notifications, really helps me and helps the channel. And other than that, I hope you're having a fantastic day wherever you are in the world. Current out.